Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about ATP or adenosine triphosphate as well as photosynthesis. So to start out, let's take a look at what this ATP molecule is. In general, ATP is a molecule that stores energy and it does so by storing them in these three phosphates right here, or more specifically in the bonds between them. An ATP molecule does have a, this adenine and this ribosome connected, but the real important part of these three phosphates, and what happens is that as your body or an organism creates the bonds between those, it's going to store energy up. To release that energy, they simply break the bonds. ATP is by no means the most energetic molecule in your body. However, it is a good intermediate and acts like a $20 bill. Your $20 bill can't buy anything, but it can buy a lot of things. And you can put a bunch of $20 bills together to purchase a larger thing. That's what your body does. Each little tiny movement inside of a muscle is powered by an ATP. One ATP alone could never move a muscle. However, you put enough ATPs together and you get muscle contraction. This energy store storage molecule is very important to your body. Again, the bonds that are present right here between these phosphates are where energy is stored. And when you break those bonds, that's how you release those energy. If we're going to talk about photosynthesis, though, we need to understand a couple basic things about light. With photosynthesis, we're going to focus on the actual visible spectrum of light, uh, which here is Roy G. Biv, although the eye is gone in indigo. Um, Roy G. Biv is backwards red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And Roy G. Biv is a way to remember what's going on in this wavelength or the spectrum of visible light. This is what your eyes can see, and it's a very small part of actual light. There's, you know, all the way as small of a wavelength as gamma ray radiation and as large as radio uh, waves. But, but this is what your eyes can see and this is actually what pigments absorb. Uh, you will notice that most flowers are within this, this greenish yellow range and we're going to find out why here in a moment. Uh, but it has to do with, with the pigments. Uh, pigments are energy absorbing molecules that are inside plants and you have pigments as well they're in your skin and they'll determine how dark your skin is or how light your skin is depending on the number of pigments your pigments however just absorb that light to protect you these pigments in a plant actually absorb light as a form of collecting energy and they're going to use that light energy to generate ATP and NADPH and then use those two things to make sugars so if we take a look here, we have three of the main pigments you're going to find in photosynthesis in this chart, and we're going to look at their absorption rates. And if you notice over here, there's estimated absorption by percent. And so again, 100% means all of it's absorbed, uh, looking like we're going to be around on 80 for even the best of those. But what I mean by absorption is the amount of that light that is taken in and not re-released. Everything that you see in the world around you is light that has been reflected. And if we take a look here, absorption rates for green, yellow, uh, are very, very low. And this should make sense because almost all the plant leaves that you see are green and yellow because that light's being reflected away. The rest of the light is being absorbed. Uh, these violets, blues, and your oranges and reds, they're being absorbed so you don't see those as much. And so that's why plants appear to be green and yellow. Uh, a primary pigment is chlorophyll. It's found on the thylakoid structures inside your chloroplast. And chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B work together to absorb a large amount of the light needed. If we take a look, chlorophyll A is the blue line. And if you track it with me, you'll see that chlorophyll A absorbs very well in the violet to lower blue range. And so chlorophyll A does a good job of absorbing there. It also pops back up and chlorophyll A will absorb in the orange and red range. So any of this violet or orange and red light will be absorbed by chlorophyll A and that energy will be taken in. Uh, chlorophyll B is a little different. It does absorb some violet, uh, but it actually really peaks right here with this blue. <coughs> You'll notice that chlorophyll B uh, does not absorb green. It really has a, a sharp drop off right there before you get to green, but it's great in the blue range. It also pops right back up, just like chlorophyll A did, over on the orange side. It doesn't go as far into red, but you'll see it here definitely taking a large part of orange. What this means is that chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B together are going to cover a large range. If we look at that, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B cover blue to violet, orange to the mid-red. And that's important because those two things are going to cover just about everything. And, uh, and we're going to see later on how that energy gets used. If we look at carotenoids, it's important to include those because they're actually the reason for a phenomenon we have in the fall. So carotenoids absorb violets and blues and even a little bit into the green range here, but not much. 
uh, but they do not reappear over here in the orange and red. You don't see them there. And so what happens is, as fall comes, trees that are deciduous, which means they lose their leaves, are going to stop producing chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Those, those pigments are going to break down. And when chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B break down, only your carotenoids are left, which means now your leaves are going to, absorb, going to reflect not only green, yellow, but also oranges and reds. And that's why your leaves will end up turning brown, because if you mix all four of these colors together, you'll end up getting brown. Uh, a note for that, if you want an example, is mixing yellow mustard with red ketchup. You mix mustard and ketchup together, you get brown. And so these two things, these four colors mixed together, uh, are why leaves turn brown, and sometimes why they'll appear red or orange for a period of time. So what happens in photosynthesis is, in general, simple, even if the intricacies inside of it are very complicated. Uh, looking at the equation itself in words, you'll see it down here, uh, it is carbon dioxide and water uh, using light energy, which we just talked about being collected by pigments, is going to be turned into sugars and oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct. We split photosynthesis into two reactions. Uh, first off, the light dependent reactions, which means they are directly dependent on light. If light is not present, these things don't happen. And then, of course, we have the light independent reactions. Uh, which are also called the Calvin cycle for the uh, scientists that discovered them. It's a little misleading to call them truly light independent uh, because they're going to rely on this ATP and NADPH to function and your plant gets that from the light cycle. So they do need light, but what, what it's saying by light independent reactions is that if you have NADPH and ATP, this process will happen. So if we were able to artificially supply a plant with these two molecules, they would never need light. However, in nature, they're gonna use light to get them. So those are our two different reactions, and we're gonna look at them all together. If we zoom in on light dependent reactions, what you'll see is that light will come in and it strikes these structures called thylakoids. You see them stacked here in a granum. That light gets absorbed by a molecule called pigments, and what it will do is it'll energize electrons, and these energized electrons will react in photosystems uh, to capture that energy, and what those photosystems will do is they will make ATP and NADPH. One of the first photosystems will actually take in water. And what it will do with water is it will use light energy to split that water. And what it will split it into is oxygen and hydrogens. Now, you'll notice the hydrogens aren't coming off of here. Well, the hydrogens end up get used in the processes of the cell. Uh, some of them you can see here by going from NADP plus to NADPH will be attached to NADPH. Others will be used in a hydrogen ion concentration gradient that will be used to generate ATP. So the hydrogens get used as do the electrons from those hydrogens, but the oxygen is a straight byproduct. So what was happening is that in the light dependent reactions, all of the oxygen that we breathe is generated inside the thylakoids and it'll eventually be shipped outside the cell as a waste. If we look at the light independent reactions, over here you notice it's not happening in the thylakoids anymore. It's happening inside the stroma of the chloroplast. Again, all of photosynthesis is occurring in this single organelle and in the stroma is where you're going to get the light independent reactions. It requires NADPH and ATP and what it's going to do is it's going to take these two molecules and it's going to use them uh, in multiple steps using enzymes to take carbon dioxide and turn it into sugars. Uh, the original sugar will be what we call a G3P, but you put two of those together and you get a glucose. Um, to give you a reference of where you might find glucose in your house, uh, your table sugar is a sugar molecule called sucrose. That is two glucoses bonded together. So what's going to happen in your light-independent reaction is it's going to use energy molecules from your light-dependent reactions and it's going to take in CO2. The Calvin cycle will take place. Enzymes will change CO2, combining three of them together into one G3P, six of them together to give you um, a sugar. And so if you notice down here on our chemical side, we have six CO2 coming in to form one C6H12O6. That's a glucose molecule, and it's going to take six carbon dioxide to do that. Taking a closer look at the Calvin cycle, um, you're going to notice that CO2 enters into the cell. We have six of them here. And we're going to drop off 12 ATP, uh, 12 NADPH, to take that six carbon dioxides and turn them into two G3Ps that you see here. Notice that there's one, two, three carbons in this molecule. That's why we call it a G3P. You put two of those three carbon molecules together, 
2 times 3 is 6, and you end up with glucose. On the back side of that, we're going to spend an additional 6 ATP regenerating a very important enzyme right here, which is a 6-carbon enzyme known as ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBP. And ribulose bisphosphate is very important because it's the actual molecule that's going to collect CO2. If it wasn't for this final little step here, this wouldn't be a cycle. It would stop with one turn. But because of this last step of spending more ATP to regenerate ribulose bisphosphate, you're able to continually take in carbon dioxide and continually spit out um, uh, these G3Ps and glucose sugars. Again, you will notice here that there's no light directly entering this process. That's why we end up calling it the light independent reactions. But both ATP and NADPH are going to come from the light-dependent reactions. That's where the, the actual plant gets its energy. So by using the Calvin cycle with our light-dependent reactions, plant cells can generate the sugar compounds that they are then able to use for energy or building structures. There are a couple different types of photosynthesis. Uh, the first one that we've really been talking about is C3, uh, and here I have some rice. Uh, basically, it's what we just talked about. There's a chloroplast. It's going to function normally. Uh, then we have C4 plants, like this corn here, and what they do is they have an extra enzyme called PEP carboxylase, and what PEP carboxylase does is it's going to actually um, use a little bit of ATP to guarantee that it gets CO2. C4 plants will outcompete C3 plants on really hot, humid uh, days, and so if the hotter your environment is, the better off a C4 plant's going to do. Cam plants, uh, I, I call them the super water savers, uh, the best example we, we have is cacti. And what they're good at is that they're really good at storing water, and they actually have a very similar process to C4 plants. They're going to use PEP carboxylase, but what they do is they only breathe at night. So at night, they're going to open their stomata, and they're going to let CO2 come in, and they're going to store that CO2 up as an actual product called malate. And so all night long, they're going to be storing malate, and then during the day when their light dependent reactions can occur, they're going to shut their stomata and they're going to use the carbon from that malate and they're going to use it as long as it lasts. One thing you'll notice about cam plants is they grow slowly. That's because they're not growing all day long. A C4 plant and a C3 plant, they're going to grow so long as they've got light. But neither of these could grow in a really arid environment. And that's why you're going to see cacti in arid environments because they've got a, multi, a, a changed form of photosynthesis that allows them to handle very, very dry climates.